Hey all, here at OS Reviews, you're watching our retro throwback of the Samsung Pixel 12. This was another phone from 2009, and it was the first device to have a 12 megapixel camera. And today, many of our smartphones still have 12 or 13 megapixel sensors. So it's really interesting how this phone, which is almost a decade old, has similar megapixels on paper. Of course, we expect sensors on modern smartphones to have improved uh, in other areas. However, again, this was definitely a big step forward at the time. The Pixel 12 also sported a 3.1 inch AMOLED screen, but it was a resistive touchscreen. It did feature Wi Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS, and this version here was actually originally on contract uh, with AnyCall, which is a carrier in Korea. This phone does have a xenon flash as well, so it should illuminate subjects better at night. It's the same type of uh, flash that's used on point and shoot standalone cameras. Oftentimes, our smartphones will only use LED because it's more energy efficient. There's also an interesting beauty mode, support quite a few video codecs it seems um, and other phones around this era include the samsung innovate which was the first 8 megapixel smartphone we also did a throwback review on that very recently uh, also from samsung but that one had a non-touchscreen display and it used the symbian operating system whereas this one has a proprietary uh, os designed by samsung again the pixon 12 was a device that was advertised primarily for its camera. In fact, it almost looks like a point-and-shoot digital camera from the back. The concept of camera phones has really not gone away since then. Uh, even today, we have phones like the Kodak Extra, uh, among others, that are stylized like a camera. We also have this very interesting looking CD software for a PC studio, uh, maybe for syncing photos with a computer, not really sure, simply you don't see that on any modern phones anymore. We have also the documentation guides, which are printed, it seems like, all in Korean. So we have just a user manual for the phone, along with another one, actually this one is in English. Very interesting looking carrying pouch with this almost carbon fiber like texture. There's also what looks like an adapter for headphones. It transforms micro USB into a standard 3.5 millimeters along with a microphone and a talk and end key. So that was a little accessory that you would want to not lose. And there's also what looks like bundled earphones as well. It's gold plated and also has these pretty fancy looking in your style tips. We had the charger itself, which is simply using micro USB. And there's also a micro USB cable for transferring data with a computer. And there are two batteries. That's very interesting. In fact, I can't recall the last time I've seen a phone come with two batteries. And there's even a micro SD card slot included. It's two gigabytes, and I have a suspicion that you probably will need this because phones back then did not come with much built-in memory. So to take images, especially at 12 megapixels, you'll probably need to use the memory card. And we have these chrome accented edges, including a slot for the micro SD card, which is actually pretty convenient because it means you don't have to remove the back cover to access the memory card, which was actually a, a pretty rare feature back then. There's also a lock button for the touchscreen that deactivates it when you're not using it. And on the other side, there is a two-stage camera shutter key for taking images. There's a button for launching the camera very quickly. And there's also dedicated volume rockers that serves as zoom controls for the camera, which is pretty cool. The top houses a cover for the micro USB port for charging. And there's also, it looks like a little port that you can press on to remove the back cover. Speaking of, the back cover has a very interesting uh, design. As you can see here, it reminds you, again, a lot of a regular camera, especially with this grip, which is made out of some synthetic leather, and the back plate is made out of metal, so as you're holding it, it really does feel like a regular camera as opposed to a smartphone. For once, the battery was actually completely dead, so I charged it up, and now we're greeted to the Samsung TouchWiz-inspired UI. We have this lock screen that I can tap and hold to unlock. Uh, interestingly, Samsung also built in gestures. So you can program different symbols and letters that will unlock it or take you to specific applications right from the lock screen. Taking a look at the home screen, we have three panels that we can customize. You can definitely tell that this is a pretty early uh, smartphone OS just because the transitions here, again, are pretty slow by 2018 standards, and it takes a second for all the widgets to reload, but at least you had that option. And back then, Samsung always put all of their widgets on this little bar that you could slide up and uh, easily maneuver. Unfortunately, there was no way to add additional widgets to this collection, but at least you have a fair selection that included time, utility tools, as well as some social media networking tools. The screen is again resistive, so it's not 
going to be quite as sensitive as modern touchscreens. You can actually use any pen or stylus to type on it. There is a little bit of optimization in the sense that you can actually press on a key and it becomes a little bit larger, so it's easier to see what you're typing as you're going along on a smaller display. Furthermore, there's haptic feedback, so the phone will physically vibrate uh, like you're tapping on a real button as you are using the display, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also have a photo uh, album viewer. Over here we have a Wi-Fi widget, so let's turn Wi-Fi on right now. And again, we have lots of these very interesting transitions and visualizations. Like for Wi-Fi, for instance, if we do a search, um, what it's going to do is show all the available networks in this format that uh, reminds me a little bit of a mesh network. Um, but anyways, it seems like we are connected and uh, afterwards we can just launch into the browser. We can start something like Google Maps and it's uh, Java powered on this phone and it will still load up and run just fine. There's no pinch to zoom since it's a resistive screen, but uh, at least I can do things like uh, I can search the map, I can take a look at a satellite view, that gives me some more details about what the traffic information is like in the Seattle region. I can also zoom in to get more details, crop around. This is the Space Needle, it seems like. And so we actually get a pretty usable experience for things like navigation still. Um, I can also use this for turn-by-turn -turn directions. Again, since there is a GPS chipset built right on end, I can also save maps for offline use, things like that. So let's exit out of this app. We also have access to a menu key on the bottom that can take us to the full array of applications on the phone. And from here, we can take a look at things like a internet browser. We can take a look at some of their media viewers. Um, there's also an MP3 music player. We have all of our games in this little app. And Samsung actually built, has built in quite a few of uh, apps on here, including Asphalt 4, uh, which uh, uses the accelerometer and the touchscreen for navigation. Now, most of these all are trial versions of games, so they don't work quite as well as the full version but um, at least it is playable. And now the game is starting, so we can definitely tell that, again, graphics have been significantly improved uh, in the later generations of the Asphalt games available on Android and iOS, but you can get a pretty similar idea of how the game functions uh, on this. There's puzzle games on here as well. Tumbling Dice, which is an interesting accelerometer-based app. Not really a game, but it gives you a virtual dice that you can throw just by shaking the phone and the dice will also move. So if you're playing back a real board game, if you're trying to bet with someone, uh, this actually is an interesting little app that's built on in. It's also found on many of Samsung's Bada OS powered phones back in the day. And the music player, it's, uh, it's very simple, but the interface is actually quite attractive. You can sort through music by album, uh, by genre, by uh, artist name, and you can hear this is what the audio quality is like. So again, it is coming out from the back, so it gets muffled up a little bit easily. But it does get reasonably loud, and there's also uh, cover art support. So you can actually use the accelerometer, and it uh, goes into this kind of iPod, uh, you know, cover flow inspired uh, design. So if you have multiple tracks and different types of uh, cover art, you can scroll through it horizontally, which is actually a pretty cool way of displaying your music. Right. So now let's take a quick look at the camera, since that is the main. Uh, you know, feature of this particular phone. So this is what the interface is like. Um, it takes a few seconds for the flash to charge because again, it's a xenon flash that takes more power than a standard LED flash that we have on the vast majority of smartphones even today. So we can see that the interface is quite simple. The icons actually go away after a few seconds of inactivity. We can take a look at how many images we can still take with the memory card, battery percentage remaining. Um, I can also tap to focus and on the side we can set it to various modes including smart auto. The smart auto actually works quite well and is able to detect scenes pretty convincingly. So if you guys remember in Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Spain, uh, a few manufacturers were making a huge deal out of how their smartphone cameras had quote unquote AI software that could detect scenes like landscape or faces uh, to adjust the profiles accordingly. But this is something that actually you can find even on really early phones like this device here, as well as many other point and shoot cameras. In terms of focusing, I can tap once and afterwards I can just simply press down to capture an image. Compared to modern phones, the biggest difference really is the shutter speed. It's quite slow to completely capture a shot. Uh, but something that's pretty cool is that there is a mechanical door that closes over the camera lens when you're not using it. Uh, so if we try that again by exiting out of this app, 
you'll be able to see how the door has closed. Because there isn't pinch to zoom, in order to zoom into a shot, you need to tap for a few seconds and then uh, drag upwards, and that will allow you to uh, actually zoom in. And you can see this is what that gesture is like. Surprisingly, on such a you know an early phone, uh, camera quality is actually still very, very good. Compared to a lot of modern day smartphones, especially budget or mid-tier devices, I was surprised because the Pixel 12 actually still holds up. In fact, in many cases, it's still a better camera phone than many modern 2018 low-end Android devices. Um, so it proves that, again, back in the day, this was one of the best cameras that you could purchase on a cell phone, and Samsung did a great job with the optics. And here are three just very quick images that you can see how it fares indoors. Again, all these colors and details are captured surprisingly well. Let's try zooming in a little bit more uh, and let it kind of snap into focus again. And we can check out all these small details on the rocks as well as in this uh, micro landscape. So again, camera quality, excellent, as you would expect from a device that's uh, advertised primarily for its camera performance. All right, so next let's take a quick look at the web browser and see if it's still functional. And yes, surprisingly, it still works, but it's not gonna be nearly as fast, fluid, or responsive as on a modern browser. Um, web browsing was never really a forte on this device even back in its day, but you can see that it will load up uh, pages without too many problems at least the mobile versions of the sites. Take a look at some of these other apps. There's Dynamic Canvas, which uh, is very interesting because it seems like almost a primitive version of something like uh, you know, S Notes, as we see it on Samsung Galaxy Note devices today. Um, on this AMOLED panel with these really nice contrasts between the background and the text, uh, it actually makes for a pretty nice uh, little doodling tool that you can use to jot down notes, things like that. It's multitasking, you long hold on the center key, and that brings up the multitasking panel where you can slide back and forth between open apps you can end all applications. I can even see a 3D view, which uh, displays as kind of like a deck of cards. And from here, I can uh, tap to close an app, but you can't use any gestures. Um, you can see it takes a few seconds, but uh, afterwards, it is, again, a pretty functional multitasking uh, implementation. Here's what it looks like in the included folio case, a very interesting texture. And because the lens uh, protrudes from the body ever so slightly, in the case, it actually becomes completely flat. So a very interesting design. If we remove it from the case, a quick size comparison with the aforementioned Samsung Innovate, which was its uh, predecessor. It has an 8 megapixel lens, runs on Symbian OS. It's not a touchscreen device, but you can see how the design is uh, fairly similar. And I just noticed you can actually flip open the box like this, and it has a panel that says Samsung, and then Pixon 12's shoot, see, share in an instant. But it's at least interesting to see how far Samsung has come and how their designs have evolved through the years. So thanks for watching this video here at OS Reviews. This was our look back of the Samsung Pixon 12.